Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host Simon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What happens here? One of my writers in this case, Katie. Thank you, Katie. Has written me a script all about the Jersey Devil. I feel like I know vaguely about this, but if someone asked me right now, what's the Jersey Devil? I'll be like, it's an Australian thing. Mate, right? Maybe? I don't know. That's why the, the format of the show, I've never read this before. We're going to explore it together. We're going to decode it, dear audience. This is clever, isn't it? It's in, the, it's in the name of the show. Let's dive in. Hello, and welcome to yet another installment in our series on cryptids. Strange creatures that probably don't exist, but people keep insisting that they do, so someone gets to make videos about them. Yes, yes, yes. As I often say, this show, despite being called... Deca I mean... I, I, I've said this many times, I didn't want to call this like Skeptical Simon's show, but then no one would watch it because you've got to get those people in. Like, hello, cryptids, yes, please, that's real. And then we dump all over your dreams, dear listener. Or viewer, if you're on YouTube, hello. If you're on YouTube, you can see I'm only wearing a t-shirt. Normally I wear a jacket, but God damn, is it hot outside today. And it's, it's late April. No, it's late March. And it's hot. And my heating in my office is still on. I just turned it off, but it's still roasting. I was actually sweating recording an episode a minute ago. Different show. I was like, just beads of sweat falling down my head. So I was like, I gotta lose the jacket. Just gotta do it. If you're tired of sacrificing style practicality when it comes to your footwear, well, say hello to today's fantastic sponsor, Vessi. Look, spring is here, summer is around the corner, and it's the perfect time to get a pair of shoes that are going to suit those new seasons, especially spring, because these things are made with something called Dymatex, which makes them 100% waterproof. They don't look like waterproof shoes in any way whatsoever, but up to this point, you can be like this deep in a puddle and you'll be you'll, you'll have completely dry socks and in spring you know unexpected spring showers and all of that these will keep your feet dry this one is the Stormburst Low Top. This is the newest edition. I've actually had a pair of the high tops for a while in white, which I've very much enjoyed wearing, but now spring is here. Switch to the low tops. They've got excellent grip, perfect for rainy days, and of course, 100% waterproof. Then there are the weekend sneakers. Great for any activity. They're not sweaty either. Like summer is here. You might think, oh, it's waterproof. I'm going to get really sweaty feet. You don't. It's uh, sort of like magic. I wear my Vessies just year round. And you don't even have to think about it. So you can discover more at vessi.com forward slash unknown forward slash and get ready to stay cool and dry with an automatic 15% discount off your first purchase at checkout. Thank you to Vessi for sponsoring the video. And now back to today's episode. Today we're taking on the Jersey Devil, or should there be the Joysy Devil, a cryptid, as it turns out. I knew precisely zero about. Okay, Joysy. Joysy. That sounds like American though. Joysy Devil! I don't know, that's, that sounds like British. Oh god, I'm terrible at accents. At first I thought, here we go again, another obviously not real creature that sounds so far-fetched I wonder what's in the drinking water, but then as I read more about it, there's actually a surprisingly interesting historical aspect to the whole thing. Well, I found it interesting anyway, and I hope everyone else makes it that far as it's at the end, as we're going to get the weird stuff out of the way first, so let's go! A Devil's Playing Field did you know that New Jersey, okay, never mind, not Australia. I guess that makes sense, Jersey being in the year. Jersey, the only thing I know about Jersey is called The Garden State because of that excellent movie with an even better soundtrack called Garden State. It's about Jersey. <laughs> and there's also that show, The Jersey Shore. We have, I think we have like our own show in the UK about Essex. Essex is like our version of New Jersey <laughs> in the UK. Did you know that New Jersey is the only state in the US with its own official state demon? It's got all the usual state living insignia. You've got your brook trout being the state fish, the beautiful violet being the state flower, the eastern goldfinch being the state bird, and the Jersey devil being the state demon. So what is this thing? Well, let's hear the origin story of a legend that's lasted for hundreds of years. Back in 1735, the Leeds family lived deep in the Pine Barrens area of New Jersey. Japheth Jap, Jap, Japheth? Japheth. That's a name people don't have anymore. Japheth Leeds and his wife, who was also known as Mother Leeds, already had 12 children. So when Mother Leeds found out she was pregnant again with number 13, she cursed and spat, let this one be a devil. On a dark and stormy night, her 13th child was born at first and all seemed fine. But then what was initially a human baby boy suddenly sprouted fur, wings, and a tail with a blood-curdling scream that attacked everyone in the house killing Mother Leeds and a midwife, and flew up the chimney, disappearing into the million square acres of the Pine Barrens. Katie, did you say that this was real? Because this is obviously not real. Also, 
if you don't want to have 13, it's not like 1735. I know people are like, oh yeah, they didn't have birth control. People had so many kids. Fun fact, um, how to say it in a, in a coitus interruptus, I think is what it's, is the medical term. That is a very effective method of birth control. Surprisingly effective. And people have been able to do that forever. So if you've had 13 kids, don't be like, well, there were no condoms. There were no pills. There was no vasectomy. It's just, uh, yeah, you had, you had effective birth control. You just weren't using it, weren't you, mother leads? That's why you got 13 children. From time to time over the years, people have reported encounters with the Jersey Devil, originally known as the Leeds Devil, which have ranged from attacks on farm animals to mysterious footprints to a spate of hundreds of sightings over the course of a week in January 1909. The longevity of the legend is clear, as many current-day weird experiences that people have had in the area are credited to the Jersey Devil and photos such as one taken in 2015 and another taken by a father and son in 2018 continue to give life to the story. Guys, what is it, some sort of magical creature? When was this? 1735. What, it's still alive 300 years later? I mean, I guess it could have had kids and stuff. But then if it did, then there'd be a lot of them, wouldn't there? They'd be everywhere because it's been 300 years. There'd be like a colony. They'll be everywhere. Jersey Devil's all over the show. Now we're going to head deeper into the pines and find out a bit more about our main monster. Unlike our old pals Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster, both of those totally not real, the Jersey Devil doesn't really seem to have a set look. It has been described as being quite small at about three to four feet in height, which is just over a meter, and our hero Danny DeVito would absolutely tower over this thing. Other versions have it standing taller than a man, which usually means over six feet, so around two meters. Whoa! Or about a Danny DeVito and a third? God damn! Wait, over six feet is not around two meters. Over six feet is like, what, 182 centimeters? Something like that? I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I'm European. I do it in the, the, the metric system. But tw 202 meters is really tall. That's like a, that's like a good chunk of size over six feet. Two meters is a large person. But what does it look like? Again, accounts vary, but the general description usually contains some mixture of these characteristics. A horse's face, leathery wings, a hairy body, hooves, a snake-like tail, glowing red eyes, short, clawed arms, and in 1909, fire breathing came into the mix, because that's realistic. What a hodgepodge. It also makes a horrible screeching sound. It's also been depicted as having more of a classical devil face, humanish, with long nose and pointy ears. While there haven't been any confirmed reports of fatal loss, I have to just random aside here. I'd love to learn to fire breathe. I think I think when I was a kid, I'd see I saw fire breathers and I was like, God damn, how? That's so cool. Because you take a swig of like um ethanol or water and ethanol or whatever, you put it in your mouth, and then you're like while lighting it. And I'm like, is that hard to learn? Is that dangerous? Because if you can do that, that is a fucking party trick. It's like, do you know anything cool? It's like, I know how to juggle. That's like my thing that a lot of people don't know. It's like I can juggle pretty well. I just learned to juggle one summer. And learning fire breathing would be sick. Maybe I'm in the wrong career. Maybe I should join the circus. <laughs> Yo, ChatGPT, uh, fire breathing's pretty sick, right? Do you think it's possible? How long would it take me to learn fire breathing? And is it dangerous? Yeah, fire breathing is a pretty impressive performance art. It's definitely possible, but it requires a lot of skill, practice, and safety precautions. How long it takes to learn can vary greatly from person to person. It might take a few weeks to get the basics down, but mastering it could take much longer, even months or years, depending on how often you practice and your commitment to learning the techniques safely. Fire breathing is quite dangerous, both for the performer and the audience. The risks include burns, fire hazards, and health issues from inhaling or ingesting the fuel. Because of these dangers, it's super important to learn from a professional instructor who can teach you the correct techniques and safety measures. Okay, that's kind of sick. I kind of want to learn how to, how to learn how to fire breathe. <laughs> I really enjoy those YouTube channels where people learn skills. <laughs> Should do one of those. Just fire breathing. While there haven't been any confirmed reports of fatal or even serious attacks on humans, unless you count Mother Leeds and other people present at its birth, the Jersey Devil is known for its menacing presence, its penchant for livestock, and in the past it was marked as a harbinger of doom and blamed for all manner of things from droughts to damaged trees. It usually comes out at night, and because of the many sightings that are throughout a large area of the decades, it's now firmly moved from a spooky story told in the woods to being a big part of the state's culture. And what of those sightings? Are any of them credible? Were any of the witnesses, say, the brother of a very famous French emperor and military commander? It's gotta be Napoleon, right? 
Wait, Napoleon's brother has an, in- has an interaction with the Jersey Devil. Okay. I mean, maybe not Napoleon. Why, yes, there were. Thanks for asking. I don't know much about Napoleon Bonaparte, but he had a brother called Joseph, who was no slouch himself in the leading stuff stakes, being king of Naples for a while, and then moving on to be king of Spain, as one does. I like how this guy's king of Naples, and then king of Spain, and he's like the lesser known Bonaparte. <laughs> it's like never heard of him. Anyway, after it all went a bit tits up for his brother, Joseph moved to America and bought a nice big, big plot of land in New Jersey in a place called Bordentown. According to AmericanFolklore.net, the story goes like this. One snowy afternoon, the ex-king of Spain was hunting alone in the woods near his house when he spotted some strange tracks on the ground. They looked like the tracks of a two-footed donkey. Bonaparte noticed that one foot was slightly larger than the other. The tracks ended abruptly as if the creature had flown away. He stared at the tracks for a long moment, trying to figure out what strange animal might this be. At that moment, Bonaparte heard a strange hissing noise. Turning, he found himself face to face with a large winged creature with a horse-like head and bird legs. Astonished and frightened, he froze and stared at the beast, forgetting that he was carrying a rifle. For a moment, neither of them moved. Then the creature hissed at him, beat its wings, and flew away. My my daughter is now terrified of peacocks. <laughs> We were at like a, is this like big outdoor kids play park and they got like animals roaming around and sh- and like we're standing there and I'm like, and like, you know, we're going on like, I don't know, some swing or whatever. And then there's a peacock and it comes by and it puts out all its feathers. And I'm like, hey, hey, uh, I call my, I call my daughter Romulus on the internet. Romulus, sorry, Remus, Remus, come here, check out this, uh, check out this peacock. And she's like, wow, it's so beautiful, dad. And then we're just looking at this peacock. And then we decide, okay, let's let's go do something else. And then we're walking we're walking over, and she runs ahead of me, and the peacock chases after her with its feathers out, going ah, <laughs> like making this screaming sound. And she runs away, and she seems totally fine, and then she just bursts out in tears. And now she has like a complex around peacocks because <laughs> my wife bought like a, a, a new coloring book or whatever, and there was a giant picture of a peacock, and she like she says, I don't want to color that one in. I don't like that one. <laughs> It was kind of scary. <laughs> she was now terrified of peacocks. Poor little Remus. This was around the 1820 mark, making it quite an early sighting for the beast, and by a Bonaparte, no less. I think that's the biggest celeb on the list of witnesses, the rest being normal people. Though AtlanticCounty.org notes, prominent citizens or government officials were among the many who witnessed sightings of this creature. They included businessmen, postal officials, and policemen who had seen or heard the creature and saw his tracks left in the snow. So, let's move to 1909 now, when between the 16th and the 23rd of January, the creature was spotted all over a wide area from New Jersey into the neighboring states of Delaware and Pennsylvania. Hoofprints were spotted in snowy paths and on rooftops, suddenly vanishing as though whatever made them flew away. Small animals and chickens were being slaughtered. People reported seeing a horse-headed creature with burning eyes. The term Jersey Devil hadn't yet been coined, so newspapers ran headlines such as Leeds Devil runs rampant in Jersey. Jersey Biped has hoofs. Uncanny tracks revive legend of devils seen long ago. Many persons see Jersey's terror. And Weird Wild Beast has Jersey's nerve. These are like the most, you know, Weird Wild Beast has Jersey nerve. Catch your paper here. Roll up, roll up. <laughs> it's like the most old school. Like, what? I, people had weird titles for shit in the past. If I called all my YouTube videos with titles like this, no one would click on them. <laughs> like, why is this historical shit? Other terms were thrown around, such as hist, jabberwock here, spits fire, and wazzlebug makes visit to Trenton. <laughs> wazzlebug, what the fuck? Most of these articles talk about people locking their doors after seeing a weird biped with hooves or seeing strange footprints outside. A Mr. and Mrs. Evans had a close encounter which was reported as Mr. and Mrs. Evans described the monster as being about three feet six inches in height, with wings two feet long on each side, a head like a collie dog, with a face on the order of a horse, long neck, and four legs. New York's The Sun newspaper ran an article with the title what ails South Jersey? Strange conduct, even though this is the hot apple toddy season. Wait, what? <laughs> it's like, there's a devil there, and that's really strange because we're all outside drinking hot beverages. How are those things related? The panic was so widespread that traps were set out and armed farmers went out in groups looking for the thing. On the 20th of January, the Inquirer published a piece titled, Hunting Expeditions Seek Strange Creature, which has left ho- hoof-like tracks in many sections. It goes on to say, efforts of a party of young farmers living near Jacksonville to track the creature today proved fruitless. Hounds put on the trail, refused to follow the tracks, and with bristling hair and the picture of terror, ran home. The farmers followed the tracks for nearly 400 miles, and the hoofprints mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> this is this is my old newscaster voice. Is that called Mid-Atlantic? 
like how people always used to speak on the past in like uh, movies and because they wanted to appeal to like British and American people, so they just chose an accent that was somewhere in between. And it does sound very in between. It's quite clever. The Philadelphia Zoo offered $10,000 for the capture of the Jersey Devil, which is nearly $350,000 today. You may be unsurprised to learn that nobody claimed the cash. After a week of this panic, in which schools and factories also closed down as either a safety measure or because of lack of people turning up, the story eventually fizzled out. Some papers printed stories of the creature having been electrocuted on a railway line, but as far as I can tell, the story was over as fast as it began. There were still periodic sightings over the years, almost exclusively under the Jersey Devil moniker, with many referring to a kangaroo-type body shape and red eyes. What was that, with a, with a horse's head? The horse's head is like the weirdest part. Like, because a horse's head is massive. Like, that's a big animal, and it's just flying. That's a more, sort of pterodactyl. Pterodactyl is like a horse-shaped head, right? But like more narrow and weird. Even recently, there have been sightings with a photo taken by David Black in 2015 purportedly showing what he initially thought was a llama before it suddenly flew into the air. Michael Robinson and his son Stephen Coulter saw a wild creature in a field in 2018 and snapped a few pictures from what they estimate to be about 150 yards away or 137 meters. Why does Michael Robinson have a son with a different surname? <laughs> That's the least important thing here, but I'm like, wait, that doesn't make sense. I'm sure it does. I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation, but I'm still like, that tripped me up. They are pretty grainy, but you can make out some vaguely horse-shaped thing, which they described as ghost-like and like a mirage. Oh, what a surprise. The picture of the cryptid is kind of blurry. <laughs> it's 2018. You had iPhones. They also point out in a video on app.com from 2021 that they have driven all the way out to this field again four years after the initial encounter to talk about it. And if they were lying, they would have just said it was in the woods around the corner from where they lived in the first place. Um, wait, that's what they said? <laughs> and it doesn't make... And it's like, oh, you always thought about it, didn't you? Which kind of discounts the whole thing. The Jersey Devil has made itself a popular presence in the cultural sphere too, with ice hockey team the New Jersey Devils being named after it. There's also the Jersey Devil Coaster in New Jersey's Six Flags Amusement Park, but this depicts the creature as more of an archetypal humanoid demon than as a horse-headed kangaroo with wings. This may be because the statue used in the queuing system was a repurposed from an old ride called El Diablo, so they just had to maintain a consistent devil throughout. <laughs> so that's the cheapest way to do something. It's like, yeah, we need a new roller coaster. Well, let's just take the old roller coaster and, uh, I don't know, put a fucking horse's head on the devil and be done with it. The fifth episode ever of The X-Files featured the Jersey Devil, which I was going to go back and re-watch but never got around to. But according to cryptids.fandom.com, quote, Unlike more common and fantastic descriptions, the Jersey Devil of the episode is instead likened to a feral humanoid or possible subspecies of mankind. While this flies in the face of all the traditional descriptions of the creature, the lack of special effects budgeting in the early episodes of The X-Files undoubtedly forced the producers to make a more cost-effective version of the creature. So there's 44 minutes of my life that I saved myself. Uh... I don't know. X-Files is pretty good. I haven't seen it since I was a kid. It used to scare the shit out of me as a kid. I was watching the X-Files way too young. I used to watch it on Friday nights before Friends. Friends came on at 10, and I think X-Files was on from 9 to 10. And I'd always watch the X-Files, and then I'd have to watch Friends afterwards, because otherwise I'd go to bed and have nightmares from the X-Files. <laughs> there are several movies about it, one of which, 13th Child from 2002, has an astonishing 2.9 out of 10 on IMDb, which still isn't as bad as Manos, The Hand of Fate but it's definitely no Shawshank Redemption. It's also been featured in loads of books, other TV shows, video games, etc. So it's a bona fide member of the Cryptid Squad, even if its appearance has varied wildly over the years. All right, then, we've given it a fair shake. Now let's go back and decode this guy. Jersey, sure. The origin story we're told at the start related to Mother Leeds, a woman who had already had a dozen kids, so cursed her 13th pregnancy, which then obligingly turned into a nightmare creature, which may or may not have killed her. Accounts vary. I can see where she's coming from, being so exasperated and whatnot, but maybe she could have done what my grandparents used to say in this situation and sewn Mr. Leeds' pajama bottoms up. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Or they could have just used coitus interruptus. <laughs> say that, it's, it's effective. It's like... Doesn't it have the, like, the same effectiveness as condoms or something when, it, when like, executed properly? <laughs> Never thought I'd be talking so much about coitus interruptus in an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Ah, there are other variations on this story, such as a girl being cursed by locals for being pregnant with a British soldier's baby, which was a big treasonous no-no at the time, and a girl being cursed by a gypsy for not having, giving her enough food, but the mother leads one is the one that stuck, probably because the Leeds family was populous 
and gave its name to Leeds Point in what is now Atlantic County, New Jersey. The whole 13th child element has a creepy ring to it, adding a nice gloss of superstition to the story. Oh, because 13's unlucky, I didn't even pick up on that. But hey, guess what? Mother Leeds was actually a real person. Yeah, but the, her birthing a demon, then it running up the chimney after murdering her and everyone else. It's not real. It's not how things work. This is one cryptid tale that actually has some roots in real life, and they go even deeper than this, but we'll come to that later. According to findagrave.com, because spoiler alert, she's dead, Deborah Smith was a Quaker woman in 1685 in Burlington County, New Jersey. She married Lapth, Lap, Jap, Japheth Leeds, and they did indeed have 12 children between 1704 and 1726. What an exquisitely fun sounding 22 years for Deborah. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I had my first kid in at the end of 2019, so like just as COVID was popping off. And it's now early 2024, and we've had, me and my wife had, ever set, have a, had a second kid in that time, who's now two, and the first one's four, so they're all like two and a bit and four and a bit. And it's all, it's so much easier than it was <laughs> at the beginning. I cannot imagine having 10 more. <laughs> oh, it would take up so much of your life. No, I don't. I love my kids. But goddamn, those first years are tough. Stu, what are you doing? Making chocolate pudding. It's four o'clock in the morning. Why on earth are you making chocolate pudding? Because I've lost control of my life. This puts us right in the window of the Jersey Devil's alleged birth year of 1735, and because of her enormous brood of kids, six girls and six boys, Deborah was indeed known as Mother Leeds. That's where the fact and fiction diverge, however. Deborah Leeds had 12 children, all of them named and accounted for in genealogical records, but she did not appear to have a 13th. If the time frames are true, she would have been 50 when this 13th one was born, which I guess is not entirely unheard of, and we know she was a baby-making machine, but it's also not very likely. If she did have a 13th child, it might have died early, which is why there is no record. I think we can safely say that what it did not do was sprout rings, grow a horse face, develop a tail, and fly up out of the chimney. Mother Leeds has been cast as some sort of witch-inclined person in the story, with its inferences of curses and demonic things hidden in the backwoods, but this was not the case, as she was raised a Quaker, and if she converted to her husband's religion after marriage, she would have been an Episcopalian, which is a Christian denomination that's part of the Anglican community. Fascinating. <laughs> that's it. The only thing I know there is, like, so you've got Christians, then Anglicans, then Episcopalians. The only thing I know there is Christian. I don't know what an Anglican is. Neither of these entities encourages witchcraft, so it's likely that any salacious rumblings of what might have been going on in the Leeds house were just added afterwards to make the story more scary. The first sightings are given as having happened in 1735. However, I don't believe that there were any that early, and it was just the date given retrospectively for the birth of the devil. The next sightings of note weren't until the early 19th century, with Joseph Bonaparte, etc., uh, which was around 80 years later. It was almost 100 years after that that the big newspaper panic of 1909 happened, and there have only been sporadic sightings since, with many inconsistencies in the appearance given by witnesses. In fact, when I saw some quite recent alleged encounters with the Jersey Devil on the website weirdnj.com, none of them sounded very similar, yet all claim it was the Jersey Devil. Mary Ritzer Christiansen described it like this, quoting, The figure stood taller than a man by far, had thick haunches similar to a goat's, supporting its nearly human-looking torso and huge woolly head. Someone called Sonny Z said, It had no tail, no fur, its ribs showed, and it had a long and odd head with short ears that laid flat. It looked almost ten feet tall. There are also several accounts of people hearing horrible screams or loud noises, but not actually seeing what made them. This is similar to the behaviors of our other old friends, the Sasquatch, and also whatever monster hangs around in Portlock in Alaska, which we did an episode on a while back, but I remember almost nothing about it. Hey, me neither. <laughs> I know I remember nothing about this in about a year. I'm sure it was a good one, though. I'm sure it was, Katie. Because of the varied descriptions of this thing, it makes it hard to even work out if everyone's talking about the same creature or whether there are, in fact, multiple weird things roaming about the pine forests of New Jersey. There's also, obviously, the power of suggestion, and it's easy to blame any unsettling encounters on the local folklore, as there are many mentions of people being told by local shopkeepers or whatever that they ex what, that what they experienced must have been the state demon, the Jersey Devil. Yeah, so anyone goes into the woods and sees something a bit weird, they're like, oh, it's that Jersey Devil. Tall, was he? And the person's like, yes, horse's head, yes, 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 definitely. It was very dark, but I did see that weird horse's head somehow flying like some sort of weird pterodactyl for the record joseph bonaparte did not see the jersey devil he saw something that has now been forever enshrined as a large winged creature with a horse-like head and bird-like legs and this was not a first-hand descriptive account from jb's mouth it's just what people are saying now 
And he didn't think, Zuta Lord, the Jersey Devil. It was only a friend mentioning this later after Bonaparte told him of the sighting that linked the encounter with the legends. So, like, second hand. So basically useless and unbelievable. There we go. And even more damning, there's no actual written account by him anywhere of this encounter, so I think we could just chalk the whole thing up to being an exaggerated anecdote at best. And speaking of linking, let's fast forward to the Panic of 1909. While there were many, many articles from all over New Jersey and beyond giving eyewitness accounts and photos of hoofprints, we can put this flurry of devil activity down to two things, a kind of mass hysteria and a man called Norman Jeffries. Oh, okay, hello, Norman. New character introduced. Who are you? And why are you fucking up history? We got a situation. Amidst all the examples of newspaper headlines we gave, I did leave a tiny breadcrumb in there. The headline, Jersey Biped has hoofs. Uncanny tracks revive legend of devil seen long ago. The wording of this is notable, as it points out that there had basically been no Jersey devil activity for ages, and now all of a sudden, here's the legend being dragged up again. And who is reviving it, and why? The perpetrator of this hoax, because yes, it was most definitely a hoax, has been named as Norman Jeffries, who apparently admitted to it a few years later anyway, so I think we can say it was safely him. A publicist who was formerly in the newspaper trade, Jeffries got a sniff of the old story and just decided to run with it. His obituary in the New York Times came with the subheading, Former Philadelphia newspaper reporter gained fame by Jersey Devil hoax. So I think the cat's definitely out of the bag, or the devil's out of the pines, or whatever. It's kind of interesting, like Norman... What was his name? Jeffries? Norman Jeffries. This is the only thing, like, that you'll be... I remember making a video ages ago about some woman who, like, installed a le an illegal toilet or something in, like, the 1600s in London. And that is the only thing in the historical record about her, that she installed some illegal toilet that went wrong and, like, dumped some shit of hers in the street or something weird like that. And it's always, I don't know, I find it not, not depressing, but it's, like, just a little, you know, <laughs> nihilistic, isn't it? Everything's kind of pointless. Like, this is all he's remembered for. Some Jersey Devil hoax, but that's it. I'm sure he had le led a rich, full life, old Norman. But this is the only thing that people remember him for. According to the Philadelphia Inquirer, which also published an obituary of Jeffries, reports that the Jersey Devil had reappeared aroused his showman instinct, and he used all the arts of a press agent to build up the belief in the legend. And build up belief he did. I'm not sure if it was him going around pressing horseshoes into the snow personally, but it was definitely him sending stories around to various papers, which in turn whipped the public into a frenzy. In a 2019 article from the Philadelphia Inquirer called The Jersey Devil, the tale of a viral story from 110 years ago, journalist Joseph A. Gambadello explains how this hoax works so well. Quoting him, Two things should be kept in mind when reading the old stories about the devil. First is that journalistic standards in those days were, to say the least, loose. And newspapermen often did favors that were reciprocated with free meals or theatre tickets or bottles of booze at Christmas. Second is that in the face of fierce competition, newspapers would seek to match stories in rival publications at any cost, even if the price was the truth. Yeah, wasn't this called like the yellow era of journalism or something like that? Where it's like, yeah, I mean, news was not really... <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of fake news today, but in the past, it was even more like, it was just, you know, just stories were just made up. So basically, every paper was trying to outdo the others, and eyewitnesses may have been exaggerating, making it up to get their names in print, or were just totally fictional themselves. There was one hilarious alleged sighting that was printed, giving every stutter the witness said to convey how scared and out of breath he was as he raced to the newspaper office to tell his story. I'll just give you one part of the sentence as an example, but it was literally what the paper printed. I s -s saw are uh, only t -t two vivid eyes uh, and a sh -sh shining row uh, of teeth and a g -g glowing tail. T -t -t Today, Junior? Just say he was stuttering. Just say he stuttered, I saw only two vivid eyes and so forth. Who writes like that? I don't actually know as the article is clipped with no newspaper name given, but it was in circulation in New Jersey somewhere. A couple of papers eventually ended their coverage by reporting that the Jersey Devil had managed to short circuit itself out of existence on the railway lines, which was a pretty neat ending. But if you had kept your finger on the page of this particular choose your own adventure story, you could go back and forth and find another outcome for the beast. On January the 24th, 1990, the Ninth and Arch Museum announced that it was exhibiting the live captured Leeds Devil, as it was still known then. The poster shows a cute, derpy looking dragon, which I don't think really captured the creature's essence, with this exciting text. Try and convey the exclamation marks in your delivery, Simon. Okay. Caught and here, alive, the Leeds Devil, captured Friday after a terrific struggle, exhibited exclusively here at $1,000 a week. The fearful, frightful, ferocious monster which has been terrorizing two states. It swims, flies, gallops, exhibited securely chained. 
in a massive steel cage. A living dragon, more fearsome than the fabled monsters of mythology. Don't miss the sight of a lifetime. What is this going to be? How are they going to fake this? It's just going to be some like weird, like old school animatronic sh- something like that. How do they do this in the past? It costs 10 cents to get him, which is about $3.50 these days, which is a pretty good bargain as you ask me, is that so much it costs to go get a drink of water out of a vending machine where I live in California? Anyone venturing into the museum would see a large cage that was boarded up on three sides, with one remaining side hidden by a curtain. The curtain would briefly be pulled aside, the animal would leap at the gawping crowds, and the curtain would swiftly be pulled back again. I wonder why they're doing that? Maybe to hide something, yes? But what was in the cage? It was large and winged, but was it really the Jersey Devil? <laughs> Let me guess. Let me guess. No. (laughs) Of course not. Although the actual thing in the cage sounds about as unlikely, it was apparently a tame kangaroo that had been fitted with fake wings and had feathers and other random bits of fur stuck on it. While this may seem far-fetched, Jeffrey zoned up to his prank several years later and explained what they did. Quote, The curtain was drawn, a boy poked it with a stick, the devil uttered a yell and leaped at the bars, but it was brought up with a jerk by its clanking chains. The crowd swayed back against the wall and the curtain was quickly drawn again. The attraction was good for two weeks of crowded houses. Poor old kangaroo. (laughs) This is pretty brutal to that kangaroo. (laughs) Ah, yeah, because animal rights and shit wasn't a thing in the past. People just do whatever the f*** they wanted. It's like, what are you doing this week? Ah, yeah, they've got the kangaroo thing. What's up next week? Ah, we're just going to torture a pig. Like, f***ing hell. It seems that this was a last-ditch attempt to save the ailing Ninth and Arch Museum, whose publicist was... Can you guess who? Norman J. Wow Jeffries. But it still closed down a few weeks later. So now let's move on to the more recent sightings. I mentioned a photo taken by David Black in 2015, but to be honest, it's totally laughable. While Black gives an interview with a straight face saying he saw something weird, the photo he took looks like a statue of a winged creature was thrown in the air. Even in the blurry photo, because of course it's a blurry photo, the thing looks rigid and not biologically able to fly due to the wings being too small to support the rest. Yet this looks super fake. (laughs) Like, come on. (laughs) Come on now. I'll show the image. You'll be seeing the image on the screen, but for people just listening, it looks like one of those classic fake pictures of a cryptid. Maybe coincidentally, a video was taken of another flying creature on the same day, nine miles from Black Sighting. This video by Emily Martin was filmed in the alleged birthplace of the devil itself, Leeds Point. Black doesn't think this one looks exactly like his devil, but it definitely does look like a fake video. This was the general consensus from everyone who watched it, as the Jersey Devil was not once again catapulted into the headlines, unless you count ultra tongue in cheek things like unfortunately blurry photo released of mystical Jersey Devil from Australia's Nine News website. <laughs> That's the, that's the attention it got, some random publication in Australia. Although maybe Nine News is massive in Australia. Either way, it's like, it's not a big deal. These crappy shots remind me of the Mothman episode we did where I scathingly called a photo supposedly taken of the Mothman in 2016 a laughable, fake-looking attempt. The person who took the photos was never identified, but maybe it was one of these two pranksters trying their hands in another legend. The most recent maybe proof of the Jersey Devil comes courtesy of a 2018 series of snaps by Michael Robinson and his son, Stefan Coulter. Ah, the dude with the son with a different name. The pictures were taken from far away on a phone, and at first I thought the apparent creature in them looked very odd too. But the more I took a look at it, the more it just seemed to probably be a horse. It looks like a horse. I've got three frames here, which you'll also see on screen. If we can show the video without getting a copyright claim, we will. But it's a horse, ain't it? (laughs) No shade on these guys, as they appear very earnest in their belief that they saw something they couldn't explain, but you do get the impression that they maybe might be more open to this kind of thing than other people. As Michael says in a video on app.com, something is going on and we tend to believe it's a paranormal experience. I believe that this land we stand on right now is haunted. Haunting's not real. This isn't a real thing. You guys just want to see a demon because that's what you believe in. Seven then adds, Oh, it's probably one of the most haunted places in New Jersey, but it's unknown. Because of the legends circulating about the Jersey Devil, there's a lot more going on than just a creature that's, how do I put it, big talk to just Jersey. I think he meant something along the lines of a big deal, but it's phrases like, there's a lot more going on, and the fact that they believe in the paranormal that hints that they might have jumped to conclusions that others wouldn't have. Yeah, if I took that photo, I'd be like, oh wow, look at that horse. <laughs> it's a horse, that's all. Look at that spooky ass horse. They're far from the only ones, though. A poll taken by Fairleigh Dickinson University in 2023 found that 16% of New Jersey residents believe that the Jersey Devil is somewhat likely or very likely to be real, although interestingly, the numbers are lower among those actually living in the Pine Barrens area. Yeah, I mean, because they're informed, because <laughs> they've lived there. They haven't seen it ever. I have to say, 16% seems low. I was like, I don't know, it's America. 
I feel like it could be 40% or something. <laughs> Younger people are also more likely to believe in it than older people, which makes me think that maybe they were just more excited to be asked about a cool old legend and probably answered more with their hearts than their heads. Okay, so going back to recent photos, neither looked anything alike, which goes back to the issue of lots of different descriptions coming under the heading of the Jersey Devil. But maybe we should let this play out for a bit, because it's possible that some people have actually seen something. And well, if they did, what could it have been? Devils in the details. Where did the whole weird mishmash of horse face, bat wings, and a tail come from in the first place? It's possible that this description came from ceremonies carried out by native Lenape or Leni Lenape people. While European settlers pushed most of them off their original lands in the 1700s, they still lived around Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey. The Lenape have a legend about a spirit called Murseng, which was also known as the Mask Spirit or Living Solid Face due to its long face, of which half was red and half was black. The spirit is also traditionally described as humanoid, big and shaggy, which has also linked it to the Bigfoot legends. Although it's possible that unsuspecting Quakers might have witnessed a ceremony with a person dressed in a mask and wearing a bearskin cloak or suit, and that planted the seeds for the Leeds Devil story too. If it was just a ceremony of some sort, though, this mix-up would probably have come to light at some point. But as time went on, the Devil's Claws just sank deeper and deeper into New Jersey folklore, with many sightings making mention of glowing eyes, wings, and a long face. You know what else has been described as having wings and glowing eyes? The Mothman. While his stomping ground is in West Virginia, it's not a million miles from New Jersey, and there are a few similar conclusions that we can draw as to what people might actually have been seeing. For instance, maybe a large bird. It's always a bit of a letdown when the winged monster you thought turns out to be a bird. But if it's one that's not usually seen in the area and it's dark, you may be forgiven for thinking that it was the local demon. The Sandhill Crane is a good shout, as it's usually pretty large, reaching about at least a Danny DeVito height and can have a wingspan of up to two meters. God damn, that's a big-ass bird. It also has a bright red patch around its eyes, and it can make quite a racket. The Pine Barrens is not its usual habitat, but something similar to a crane might have been responsible for at least a few of the sightings. Because the wings are a big part of most of the descriptions, it seems unlikely that it could be a normal ground-based mammal such as a bear, but with some descriptions talking about long-hoofed feet and horns, it may well have been a moose deer or even an elk, which were found in New Jersey until the early 1800s apparently. Basically, if people were actually seeing something, it's probable that it was a real-life animal that they mistook for something else. Yes, 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 or they purposefully faked it, in my opinion. It could have also been a large predatory bird, like an owl or an eagle, carrying another animal away. Oh, that can make sense, making it look for a second like the winged creature also had arms or a tail. Just throwing out suggestions here, it could also have just been a big-ass owl. And how about a hammer-headed megabat? Is that a real thing? This is also a real thing! Okay, <laughs> funnily enough, the initial reference I found to this was on the Find a Grave website, which suggested that maybe an African hammer-headed fruit bat might have been brought over on a ship and escaped into the pines. How big is a megabat? Could a bat have two wing wingspan? That's like some proper Batman sh**. Hey, it's a theory. These bats are the largest to be found in Africa and can have a wingspan of about a meter. Okay, that's not that big, but it's still pretty big. That is really big for a bat. That scared the shit out of me. They also have long snouts, which could potentially fall under the heading of a horse-like face. Oh, there's a picture of it here. It does have a horse-like face. It's as if a horse had some sort of terrible tumor growing on its mouth. God, what an ugly creature. They also make audible honking noises, which, while they can't really be considered blood-curdling screeches, probably would weird you out if you heard them in the middle of the forest at night. So let's go back to the grainy, faraway photos taken by Michael Robinson again, because another candidate for an animal that has hooves and a face like a horse is, well, a horse. Are there wild horses roaming around the Pine Barrens? I don't think so, but there might have been in the 1700s. I also read an article on ancientorigins.net by Steve Pierce called Unmasking the True Identity of the Jersey Devil. I thought this was an unbiased piece at first, but eventually, after many hundreds of words, he writes, I connected the dots to reach the conclusion that the Jersey Devil was a dragon and a dino bird. Yeah, I feel like I've heard of ancientorigins.net, and I feel like it's one of these, like, you know, History Channel, Aliens Built the Pyramids kind of vibes. He then posts a picture from a medieval text which shows a thing that looks like a horse with wings in the corner and seems to take this as proof that a Jersey Devil-type creature was ex in existence centuries ago. Um, bro. People drew da dragons all the time. Doesn't mean dragons are real. It's a fictional creature. Like, what the fuck? He writes, Please look at the creature in the upper right of the following image. To me, it looks like a bipedal winged horse with a long tail. This was published 669 years ago. I really don't understand his point here, as also in the picture is a dog with boobs and a monk's head attached to the body of some sort of four-legged creature with a tail like a fish. Yeah, there's some... Oh, yeah. The booby dog. Zoom in on that. <laughs> 
And it's really weird. <laughs> There's some weird ass in this picture. Like, what's the... There's a... There's a Weird creature with a human monk's head. <laughs> None of these creatures have come into existence since this book was published. Yeah, there's a monk-headed dogs. I think we'd know about that. By the way, I mentioned to my daughter that I was writing the script and she said, Bro, they did the Jersey Devil so dirty. Why does it look like a velociraptor that skipped leg day? <laughs> yes, my daughter calls me bro because she's a YouTube baby. But I was quite surprised because even she knew what I was talking about. Look, I don't think that the Jersey Devil exists as per the legends. For one thing, the biology makes no sense. Also, it'd be sent. Yeah, you. Ca- it just doesn't. It's not going to fly. It's got a weird, massive horse head. Also, be centuries old by now, which is unlikely. So, are people somehow still seeing the original creature, or has it mated with local fauna and produced equally cursed offspring? Or have we been thinking about this all wrong? What if the Jersey Devil was something real, but not an actual monster? And what do you mean by that? I hear you cry. Was the Jersey Devil something inside us all along? Was it the friends we made along the way? Was the Jersey Devil the Leeds family themselves? I mean, all answers, all questions we might get answers to, I guess. I, it's, it's all just made up, though, isn't it? Like, at different points in history, different people making different shit up. Boom. What? This is such an interesting side story. Remember Mother Leeds and her whole massive family? Of course you do, this script hasn't been that long. Well, while Deborah and Japheth Leeds were real people, there were many other people with the last name Leeds in the Pine Barrens and Atlantic County area of New Jersey. Apparently, the Pine Barrens was not an ideal settler territory, given that the poor soil didn't support established European methods of farming, and I guess the name Barrens gives that away a bit. So, it became an area that poorer people ended up moving to, and also people with real or exaggerated reputational issues. Anyway, the people living in the Pine Barrens area became derogatorily clumped together and nicknamed Pineys, giving the area a sense of otherness and a place where more genteel members of society would not be caught going. This also made it a breeding ground for stories of weird things happening within this supposed community of less desirable people. Anyway, back to the real, historically confirmed Leeds family. One prominent member was Daniel Leeds, who was not married to Mother Leeds, but might have possibly been her father-in-law in real life. He was a surveyor and became an aide to Lord Cornbury, the first governor of what became New Jersey in the early 1700s. If you Google Lord Cornbury, by the way, the first thing that pops up are paintings of him in drag, although I've seen variously that A, this was a valid representation of him cross-dressing, B, it was satirical and purposefully insulting jab at him as he was not popular to say the least and see uh, not actually of him this rabbit hole is not relevant to this story so i'm just taking a running jump over it but a lot of not nice words have been said in his general vicinity nyc lgbt sites or calls him reputedly the worst british governor in america and goes on to say his political enemies considered him half-witted drunken fool a tyrant and embezzler and unfit as governor he was eventually removed from office anyway Daniel Leeds was tainted by association to Cornbury, so he was already off to a bad start. But this was added to the fact that he already incurred the rage of his na- neighbors by daring to publish an almanac in the late 1600s. It wasn't the sports almanac, Back to the Future 2. It was a book usually aimed at helping farmers by collecting information on the climate, calendar, sun, and moon rises, and other astronomical comings and goings. His American almanac was not a hit among his fellow Quakers, who thought that it was too occult and used inappropriate language. This turned out to be an It's Us of the Almanac situation, with his Quaker group buying up all the copies of his first editions and then burning them. Unsurprisingly, this led to some bad feelings between the parties, and Daniel Leeds left the Quakers and continued publishing his almanac. It seems his interests were quite at odds with the general Quaker beliefs anyway, as in 1688 he published The Temple of Wisdom for Little World in two parts, which is subtitled The First Philosophical Divine Treating of the Being of All Beings, and whence everything hath its origin as heaven, hell, angels, men and devils, earth, stars and elements. It's a bloody long subtitle, mate. He also cranked out the anti-Quaker the trumpet sounded out of the wilderness of America in 1699, so by the time he started working with Cornbury a couple of years later, he was already reviled within the community. Now you might be wondering what all of this has to do with anything, but things got so bad with Leeds periodically popping out anti-Quaker pamphlets as well as his almanacs that the founder of Quakerism himself, George Fox, ended up publishing his own pamphlets which didn't mince any words. One was called Satan's Harbinger Encountered being something, by the way, of an answer to Daniel Leeds, which according to the website alcation.org, accused Leeds of working for the devil. Are some cogs starting to turn here? It gets even better. Daniel's son, Titan Leeds, name your kids whatever you want them to be, took over the almanac business when Daniel died and ended up in a feud with one of the future founding fathers himself, Benjamin Franklin. Titan is a badass name, though. If I had another kid, I'd call them Titan middle name of industry. Franklin had started his own almanac under a pseudonym in 1732 called Poor Richard's Almanac. 
I've heard of that. It was a hit, but in an early edition, he aimed a shot at the already established Leeds Almanac by saying, just published for 1734, Poor Richard, an almanac containing the lunations, eclipses, planets' motions, and aspects, weather, sun and moon's rising and setting, high water, etc., besides many pleasant and witty verses, jests, and notable sayings, thanks to the public for his last year's encouragement, of his wife's good humor, of his prediction concerning the hour, day, and minute of Titan Leeds's death. Mr. Leeds's character remarks upon the almanac published for 1734 in Leeds's name. He had previously given Titan's time of death as October the 17th, 1733, at 3.29 p.m., at the very instant of the conjunction of the Sun and Mercury. Predicting someone's death in print isn't cool, especially the supposed exact time in a popular publication. Needless to say that Titan Leeds didn't die, as per Franklin's prediction, but when he wrote about the issue in his own publication, calling Franklin false predictor and conceited scribbler, amongst other things, Franklin carried on his hilarious joke by saying that it must be Titan's ghost talking to him and he must have risen from the dead. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's funny dude. The feud went on for several years, with Franklin having a massive advantage, as according to Hoosierkin.com, he owned and operated the printing house that churned out Titan Leeds, his main competitor's almanac. This crucial advantage allowed Franklin to read Leeds' attack and respond to them in Poor Richard's Almanac before Leeds' publication even went to press. Sounds like old, uh, what was his name? The, the writing dude. It sounds like he needs a different publisher. <laughs> Franklin's decision to commence and stir this farce of a feud did indeed boost his sales. Titan Leeds died in 1938, and Franklin did a callback to his supernatural jape in a 1940 edition of his almanac, where he wrote of Titan entering his brain through his nostril and writing, I did actually die at that moment, Leeds' ghost confessed, precisely at the hour you mentioned, with a variation of 5 minutes and 53 seconds. So, let's put some things together, shall we? We've got an outcast Daniel Leeds writing all sorts of occult and eccentric stuff who has been publicly pronounced to be working with the devil. He had several wives, all of whom died. We have his son, Titan, being publicly accused of being a ghost, and he actually dies at almost the same time as the legendary Jersey Devil is supposed to have been born. Let's add one more factoid into the mix. When Titan looked over the almanac from his dad, he changed the cover to talk about the Leeds family crest, which featured three wyverns on a shield. In case you're wondering, I absolutely was. What a wyvern is? It's a mythical dragon-like creature with wings, two legs, and a long tail. The three fighters on the 18th century covers of the almanacs not look not unlike some descriptions of what became known as the Jersey Devil. Yeah, fair play. I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but you can see it. I'm looking at it right now. You're probably looking at it as well if you're watching it. But it's kind of just like one of those old-school coat of arms drawings. So, I mean, really, it could look like anything. If you recall, the creature was originally known as the Leeds Devil. Might it not be the case that suspicion, prejudice, gossip, bad blood, and religious and political issues actually cast Daniel and or Titan as the titular Leeds Devil? The creature uh, we think of now wasn't really known as the Jersey Devil until after 1909. So has this whole thing just been a misunderstanding all along? Cryptids.fandom.com writes... It is possible that the creature's origins in the Pine Barrens from the Leeds family were a form of social discrimination taking the form of folklore. The creature's fearsome reputation, combined with the foul reputation of the family it came from, would only encourage locals to avoid the region for fear of being caught by the Jersey Devil. Cabs are here. I think it's possible to see the actual genesis of this thing now. A maligned family with a strange-looking winged creature as their family crest got the nickname of the Leeds Devil of the, or the Monster of Leeds. If you recall, the founder of the Quakers called Daniel Leeds Satan's Harbinger, which wasn't particularly nice of him. This Leeds Devil name referred to real people, but there was a lot of concern around them thanks to their non-conforming ways, so stories were probably exaggerated, built upon, and got more and more twisted over time until the origin story doubled back to become an actual monster being born into the Leeds family. A few weird encounters with unidentified but probably real animals over the decades are shot in the arm for the story via a media hoax, and we've reached the present day, where the Jersey Devil has been adopted by New Jersey as part of its cultural heritage. I must say that before I started this, I had no idea there was some actual real backstory to this legend, so that was a pleasant surprise as I'm usually just harping on about the lack of any actual evidence of a cryptic's existence. Yeah, I mean, so some of the people in the story are real, but as I always say, like, King's Cross is real. Platform 9 and 3 quarters is not. There's Platform 9, there's Platform 10, there's nothing in between. Just because some elements of a story are true doesn't mean that the more fantastical ones are. Although it does add a good amount of legitimacy rather than just making it all up. So, 
Do you now believe that the original Jersey Devil was the Leeds family themselves, or are you convinced there's a horse-faced monster flapping around in the Pine Barrens? As usual, a lack of physical evidence or convincing or even semi-convincing photos or videos puts this creature in the category of the fictional, but at least this one has more interesting history than most. And one last thing. Right at the top of the episode today, I said that the Jersey Devil was the official state demon, which is how it's presented in a myriad of places. When I went back to proofread the script, I thought I'd check the date that was put into place and found a newsletter from the New Jersey State Library. It basically said that the Jersey Devil had never been officially legally adopted as the state demon, and people have been throwing a date of 1939 around, as this was the year a book called New Jersey a guide to its past and present was published. Inside, it called the Jersey Devil the official state demon, but also said things like the demon went to the University of Hell and was working on his doctorate, so I think we can all take that with a pinch of salt. The newsletter article ends with, The idea that the legendary Jersey Devil is the official state demon of New Jersey is itself an urban legend. So while that will probably burst some people's bubbles, I'm glad I went back and checked. Yes. It's kind of how just misinformation goes around, isn't it? Just repeated and repeated. And that's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. If you're listening to us as a podcast, please leave us a review, a rating, wherever you get your shows, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that good stuff. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>